Today I want to deal with the topic of winsomely advocating for truth in biology, specifically as it comes to the transgender situation. And our goal should be to challenge the presupposition of those we are talking to that gender is internally discerned. We aren't going to change their mind, but perhaps we can make a little shift in their underlying presuppositions and even increase the doubt that already exists in their mind. But in addition, our goal is to protect your ability to stay aligned with biologic reality, which is critical in medicine because, as you have already learned, biologic sex matters in medicine. So I want to start with our two foundational worldviews as I start with each of these sessions, and that is the created worldview and the accidental worldview. And again, in the created worldview, the world has a preset structure. It thus has built-in values, the values of those of the creator. And when you go against that preset structure or go against those preset values, you only harm yourself. That is the reason for the rules within the created worldview. And so the goal of humans that, that live within that created worldview is to conform ourselves to those preset values and that preset structure in order to flourish. But in the accidental worldview, because there is no creator and the world, the universe, just came into being by accident, there are no inherent values. There is no preset structure. The universe consists simply of raw material. And therefore, the way to flourish, the goal of humans in that worldview, is to simply make use of that raw material in whatever way possible. So when we apply those worldviews to the issue of transgender identification, in the Christian worldview, gender and biologic sex are equivalent. But in the accidental worldview, gender is again determined by an internal sense or internal feelings. The Christian worldview says that we have been created in two sexes, male and female. But the accidental worldview is coming to the conclusion that gender is fluid with an ever-growing number of possibilities. In the Christian worldview, gender dysphoria is the result of a psychological abnormality and therefore the treatment should be mental health therapy as it has been for many decades. But in the accidental worldview, gender dysphoria is the result not just of discordance between the self and the body, but the problem is the body and therefore it should be changed. In addition, in the Christian worldview, we have to remember and acknowledge that the suffering of gender dysphoria is very real and should never be minimized or discounted. In the accidental worldview, the, the treatment of gender dysphoria is only gender transition and typically should be started as soon as possible. But in the Christian worldview, attempts to change secondary sexual characteristics through either cross-sex hormones or surgery are not only counterproductive, they're actually in the long term harmful to the patient. But in the accidental worldview, anyone who opposes efforts to undertake gender transition are transphobic and must be silenced and overcome. Furthermore, in the Christian worldview, efforts to delay puberty or even change secondary sexual characteristics in minors is especially troublesome and should be opposed because minors are unable to give consent to that form of treatment. Whereas in the accidental worldview, any effort to prevent children from attaining their true gender identity is nothing sh short of child abuse. So, here are some presuppositions of the accidental worldview. Efforts to affirm the correct gender identity of a person should include their preferred pronouns and referring to them by their preferred name. Anything less than complete affirmation, even within the medical setting, is often viewed as non-compliance worthy of some type of punishment.
Discussions surrounding gender identity truly represent the collision of two different worldviews, as you can see. And the reality of conflict and even persecution within healthcare is unfortunately increasing across the country. So it raises the question as to why we as Christians should risk our professional careers by pushing against this predominant worldview. And let me give you a few reasons. First of all, we are called by Jesus to be a witness for him in this world, regardless of the danger to ourselves. Remember, first century Christians often suffered and even died as they stood up for their faith in Jesus Christ against the Roman authorities. Second, the concept of gender identity ignores reality. And so when we push back against it, it allows us to maintain a coherence with biologic reality. And as I've said, this is important, especially in medicine, because biology matters. We also want to avoid cognitive dissonance. And this results when we are affirming one gender that goes against the bio biologic reality that is in front of us. So how do we winsomely advocate for biologic reality? Well, first of all, I would prayerfully pick your battles. You can avoid the use of personal pronouns by using the patient's name, and I don't see any problem using a preferred name. Second, don't unnecessarily raise the issue, especially if you are a student or a resident. Thirdly, be sure you're treating all patients with the respect they deserve as God's image bearers. But if you are being pushed into a corner and forced to either do or affirm something against your conscience when it comes to transgender ideology, you need to be prepared to take your stand. So let's imagine for a minute that a friend or a colleague comes to you and asks the question, why are you unable to affirm someone's gender identity? Well, I'm going to assume that this request is genuine, but you need to be aware that people may ask you only in a rhetorical fashion. And we have to remember Jesus' command that we are not to give dogs what is sacred and do not throw your pearls to pigs. In other words, it doesn't do any good to uh, give an answer to somebody who is not at all open to that answer. But if, in fact, this person asking is open to an answer and they are asking genuinely, then I want to go back to the framing that I've used in prior modules that talks about our levels of, of thought, the three different stories. Again, the foundation is our presuppositions, our ground floor is our principles, and the second floor is our day-to-day -day conversations and our reactions. And so typically, if this question comes to you, if you haven't thought in depth about it ahead of time, your reaction is going to come off of the second floor and may not be truly representative of what you really believe. So let's spend some time thinking about this at the foundational or presuppositional level. And here are some potential responses for you to consider. You might begin by saying that you believe that every person is created by God in his image. And you can secondarily uh, affirm that you believe that God only creates a person as male or female. Now, it is true that there are a small minority of people who are born with disorders of sexual development just as there are disorders in many other uh, uh, organ systems in the body. But this is a very small minority and a completely separate category. Otherwise, we need to affirm that God has created us either as male or female. I would suggest that you again affirm that the suffering associated with gender dysphoria is very real but that you believe that the best way to deal and help that person 
with gender dysphoria is through specialized counseling that deals with any underlying mental health issue as well as the mental health problem of gender dysphoria itself. You can conclude by saying that, in your view, changing the secondary sexual characteristics of someone, especially a minor, struggling with gender dysphoria is not only the wrong approach, but ultimately brings greater harm on the patient. Again, keep in mind that your goal is to express your sincere beliefs and you are not responsible for how the person responds. Now I would encourage you to stop the video and spend some time role-playing this conversation with someone else, working to transform these ideas into talking points of your own. In the final portion of this video, I want to address a slightly different question. And that question is along the lines of, why can't you at least respect a transgender patient by using their preferred pronouns? It's highly likely this question will come up somewhere in your, either your medical school training or in your residency training. And so let me give you some considerations for how to answer that question. You can first of all begin with stating that using a pronoun that is inconsistent with a patient's biologic sex forces you to affirm something that does not match physical reality. Second, I think it's important to bring up the fact that it introduces confusion into the medical scenario, including the medical record, and that confusion can be dangerous to the patient. And that's because you've learned that biologic sex matters in many medical conditions. Therefore, if the medical record is confusing regarding the biologic sex, it may actually, in fact, endanger the patient. You can further add that the use of preferred pronouns is affirming what is commonly known as social transition. And data has shown that especially in minors, social transition that is being affirmed will increase the likelihood of that patient going on into other forms of transition, including the use of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones. Another thing to consider stating is that you view your primary role as a healthcare professional to provide the best medical care possible for all of your patients. And you can go on to say that you cannot in good conscience affirm something that you don't believe is best for your patient. That it forces you to go against what you believe is the best care for that patient and secondly, to engage in a form of cognitive dissonance. And let me give you some additional information that may be helpful for you at this time. Studies have shown that approximately 85% of minors suffering from gender dysphoria will spontaneously resolve that gender dysphoria as they go through puberty naturally without any other intervention. As I've already alluded to, social transition of a minor increases their likelihood of continuing in gender transition therapy, including things like puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones. And lastly, the long-term effects of both puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones are not known. But preliminary evidence shows that puberty blockers have been associated with an increase in osteopenia and osteoporosis. And cross-sex hormones have been shown to raise the risk of diabetes and cardiovascular disease later in life. It's because of these potential side effects and lack of evidence that countries in Europe that have been utilizing gender transition therapy much longer than here in the United States have changed course in how they approach minors. They are moving away from active gender transition therapy and in, instead are emphasizing mental health therapy in minors. And those countries include Sweden, Norway, France, and the UK. There will be fact sheets on gender dysphoria available through links provided in the resource section of this module. So now I would 
encourage you to stop the video and begin addressing some of these discussion questions. Talk about other potential responses to these questions that I've raised, especially in light of the evidence that is accumulating regarding gender transition. Discuss how you might elaborate on the da dangers of confusion in the medical record regarding biologic sex. And finally, discuss how you might expand on the concept of cognitive dissonance that's introduced into the medical setting with the whole transgender identity issue.